church it's march 22nd and we are here to worship the lord i'm glad that you've tuned in and we are united together around the city or perhaps around the state around the nation uh, to come together in one heart with faith to worship the lord jesus and i'm glad you're here and i hope that this morning you really encounter what god is doing in your life and amongst us in our city i'm going to open us in a word of prayer Heavenly Father, God, Lord God, wherever we are at in our homes, uh, wherever we are at, Lord God, in front of our screens and computer, we pray, Father God, that your Holy Spirit is uniting us together right now. By faith, let us come together before you as we worship together in one accord, with one heart, one spirit, and one voice. We come before you in your throne of grace and glory, God, because we acknowledge you as God, and we acknowledge you as King. So we pray, Father God, that you prepare our hearts right now. Lord, will you meet with us in our rooms? Will you meet with us, God, in our homes? Would you meet with us, God, knowing, Lord God, that where we are, we are also knit together in one spirit. So we come before you this morning, God, to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's worship the Lord.
church, let's sing together. Lift our voices to the Lord and praise his name together. I lift my voice. I lift my praise to you. I lift my hands. I lift my day so far. Thank you all for joining us to worship the Lord together from near and far. And uh, though we can't be together right now, we want to make sure you know that we have a lot of different ways we can still connect. Be sure to keep checking the website for updates at EmmanuelBurbank.org, our Facebook page, search Emmanuel Church Burbank to find the Emmanuel Church page, and our private Facebook group. You can search for that at Emmanuel Church Burbank as well and request to join the group. We're also going to have weekly e-blasts as usual, so those come out on Tuesday afternoons, and we 
often receive pastoral letters from Pastor Brian. If you are not receiving either of those, you'll want to make sure and get signed up on that eblast list. And you can do that by emailing kathy.lou at emmanuelburbank.org to get on that list if you're not there yet. And we want to extend a special welcome to anyone who might be joining us for the first or second time or third time, uh, specifically online. We welcome you to this worship service, and we look forward to being able to welcome you when we gather in person again. And so to that end, we would really appreciate it if you would email us again at kathy.lou emmanuelburbank.org so that we can reach out to you and say a special hello. With that, would you join me as we enter into prayer and worship? Lord, as we come before you today, we do again ask that you hear our praises. We know that you do, Lord God. And we, um, we just ask that you receive this offering of praise we're bringing before you. Lord, we know that you inhabit the praises of your people, and you are here in this place and in homes all over this city. Lord, fill us anew with your spirit. And in these challenging times, Lord, we pray that you would grow us and that you would draw us closer and closer to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen.
Wow, Emmanuel Church, it is great to be worshiping with you. I love being the church. What other organization that's not bound by walls or not bound by location, but that we are the church wherever we are at, and we are joined together under the name of Jesus Christ. I love that. You know, I invite you as you are watching on YouTube, you're welcome to comment in the comment section as we go through the message and the service. You're welcome to dialogue with each other. Pastor Bob, I believe, is, is on that right now, and he might even be responding to you and commenting. You're welcome to go on our Facebook group as well, too, to, to post. And In fact, you know what? We haven't seen each other in a while, and I would bet many of you actually just kind of roll out of bed and then join us for the worship service. So I would kind of throw out a challenge out there to all of us, which is take a photo, a selfie of you in your pajamas and how you worship in your pajamas, all right? And post it on our Emmanuel Facebook group. Now, if your pajamas happens to be your underwear, men, forget it, all right? We're not going to do that. <laughs> so it'll be great to see our faces uh, again with each other. You know, I know this has been a, a challenging time in terms of a lot of adjustments, I know this has been a lot of shifting and changing of our lifestyles. What do we do with our time as we're sheltering in place? 
Uh, I know there's been a, a lot of uh, changes that I've struggled with. So some of the biggest adjustments I've had to have was, for me, the biggest one was not touching my face. I love touching my face, and I just do it so automatically. And I saw our drummer, Dave, touch his face. So Dave, don't do that. You were like wiping yourself there. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> but what have been some of your adjustments? What have you been doing? What activities have you been doing? I guess, you know, for some of us artists and writers, uh, self-quarantining is, is really not a big deal. I heard some other artists say, this is what we do all the time. <laughs> we self-quarantine all the time to write, to paint, uh, to do what we do. But what have you been doing? I find maybe one of the things that uh, would be a great thing to do is to finish that jigsaw puzzle. Perhaps you, you started last year. Now, how many of you guys like to do jigsaw puzzles? I've done a bunch. I'm not very good at them. All right? Uh, I don't really know how to put pieces together too well, uh, but most people have a certain approach to jigsaw puzzles. What's your approach? Uh, I hear a lot of people like to start with the edges. They find all the edge pieces, which makes sense because they're easy to spot, and then you build the border first. So you got the framework, and then you fill in the middle, right? That makes a lot of sense. Now, for me, I don't like to do it that way. When I do a jigsaw puzzle, I like to kind of start in the middle. <laughs> I pick up whatever pieces I kind of find. And I think they kind of look like they fit together. And then I just start putting them together. And, uh, and so I just sort of start very randomly. And you think, gosh, that doesn't make sense, does it? Well, for an artist, you know, the idea of creating like a, a boundary and then working within that boundary just sounds absolutely horrible to me. <laughs> but you know what's the thing that we experience when we do jigsaw puzzles? is you look at the pieces, right? And you try to guesstimate based upon the images on the pieces and the shapes that you have, you kind of guesstimate that the certain pieces fit together, all right? So then you, you, you try it out. You think, oh, there's that feeling of excitement. Those two pieces go together. They should fit, right? And then you try fitting them together, but there's that one experience that we have when the pieces don't fit together, we all go through that. We probably go through that multiple, multiple times in the course of putting together a jigsaw puzzle. And you, you kind of wonder, like, they're, they're supposed to go together. How is it that they, they don't? Uh, and, and so you, you try to make it fit, and you try to make it kind of go together, and then you almost even, at some times, you can get it in there, but then you realize it doesn't really fit because of all the gaps. And there's that dissatisfaction. The dissatisfaction of realizing it doesn't fit, and for some of us, it takes us a few seconds before we actually accept that the two pieces don't fit, and then we move on. Problems and solutions are very much like a puzzle. It's like putting two pieces together. You want to find the right solution to fit the problem. Some solutions uh, seem to kind of answer the problem or sort of fit it, but doesn't actually solve the problem. When the solution doesn't solve the problem, you have to eventually accept the solution is not the right fit for the problem. And then there are the feelings of dissatisfaction, of frustration, and confusion. And those set in because of the misfit between solution to problem, especially when we thought it should fit, when we eyeballed it and we thought, this should go together. I feel our society is going through a bit of that right now. We're going through this and, and we're feeling it. We're, we're applying solutions to a, a multi-dimensional problem, but not always seeing the results we hoped. Solutions that need to be applied also create sometimes other problems. It gets complex. We adjust and implement new measures, like shifting the, the puzzle pieces, trying to see if it actually works and fits or not, and then having to realize it doesn't quite exactly fit, and we have to shift it again and, and maybe pick up a different puzzle piece and try a different measure and solution. Today, we shift our series in our worship to address what we're all experiencing in society. Today, we're looking at the puzzle pieces. Let's read in God's Word in Mark chapter 9. Would you open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29. And as you turn there in your, in your Bibles, I'm going to open us in the word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, I, I thank you, God, that you can join us all together here this morning to worship you, to dig into your word. And we pray, Father God, that at this very moment, your Holy Spirit, Lord, would fill the homes, the living rooms, the dining rooms, the dens, the bedrooms with your spirit. 
May you be present with people as they are in front of their screens and devices. May you be present with people for people have come before you by faith to engage you in your word. And we pray, Father God, that your hand and your voice will be present to guide our thoughts and our understanding of your word. And may your word sow deeply into our spirits. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29 reads, And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him, Uh, terribly it came out and the boy was like a corpse so that most of them said he is dead but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose and when he had entered the house his disciples asked him privately why could we not cast it out and he said to them this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer you see the phrase in here in verse 14 When they came, this is how the incident begins. When they came, meaning Jesus, along with Peter, James, and John, they were entering the scene. They were away on top of a mountain, uh, meeting with God, where where Jesus revealed his glory to Peter, James, and John. And they had a, the three of the disciples there had an awe-inspiring and eye-opening experience of Jesus' glory. And now Jesus and the other three arrive into a scene where there's a huge commotion. Nine, the other nine disciples of Jesus and the scribes were arguing, according to verse 14. The Greek term for argue uh, is here used to mean dispute or debate or to contend with persistence. To contend with persistence, which means that both sides were adamant about their views. They had their own principles and points that they needed to get across. They were arguing with intensity and vigilance about their opinions. And neither were letting up. They threw statements at each other. They questioned each other. It was so intense and the problem they argued about was so severe that it drew a crowd around them. They had an audience wrapped around their whole commotion. And then Jesus arrived. Seeing the crowd and the commotion, he naturally asked his disciples, what are you arguing about with them? The phrasing of the question cannot be missed. Jesus didn't ask everyone, hey, what's going on here? He directed his question at his disciples. His disciples were his tribe, those who followed him, those who were close to him, those who had done life with him. These were his friends. So his concern was naturally about them. What are you arguing about? with them. The with them referred to the scribes. They, the disciples were arguing, disputing, contending intensely and persistently with the scribes, according to verse 14. It was very peculiar, you see, to Jesus. 
Because to find his disciples arguing with scribes, because the scribes were experts of the religious law. They were scholars of theology. So they believed they had the answers to matters of faith, anything that related to God, to spirituality, and to doctrine. So naturally, Jesus was curious as to why his disciples would be in this intense, persistent argument with these scribes. The one who answers is someone from the crowd. It's not one of the disciples. It's not the scribes. It's somebody from the crowd. In verses 17 to 18, it reads, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. See, the person who answered is a father. It's a dad. Uh, The dad's son is possessed by an unclean spirit that causes him to become mute, causes him to throw himself on the ground and foam at the mouth and grind his teeth. It sounds a lot like a seizure. I used to work with youths in a group home. Uh, Physically, oftentimes I would see Seizures taking place among these youth. Uh, And at the same time, in this case here, we see a spiritual connection, a spiritual cause to the physical illness. I've often been asked in relationship to a problem that has been seen occurring in a person's life, is it physical or is it spiritual? It doesn't have to be one or the other. There can be a spiritual cause or a spiritual influence involved, which is the case here. It's a spiritual cause that has physical ramifications and consequences. And with this particular problem here, it gets very complex. What you see here in this scene, it gets complicated. You've heard of the Taco Bell's three-layer burrito. Well, this is a three-layer problem. (laughs) The illness of the sun was the basic problem. See, then it it gets complicated because the second layer is that the father brings the son to look for Jesus to solve the problem. But Jesus was not there because he was on top of the mountain with Peter, James, and John on an important uh, appointment discussing with God about details of his mission. So the solution that they were looking for wasn't there. The solution that the father and son were looking for wasn't there. So in verse 18, the dad said, I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able to. The dad came with his son looking for Jesus, but instead of finding Jesus, he he finds other nine disciples. Uh, And and for him to ask the disciples to cast out the, the unclean spirit, it wasn't wrong for him to do that. To his credit, the dad expected the followers of Jesus to be like Jesus, they weren't Jesus himself, but they were like him. They, they, had, they, were, they were under Jesus' teachings. They, under the ex- understanding of what a disciple was, was that you expected the disciple to be like the teacher. Uh, he would have thought that, uh, disciples, you learned from him. You, you walked with Jesus. You believed in him. You've seen what he has done. You, you've been shadowing him. Uh, you, so... The understanding is that they can carry out what they have gained from Jesus. Given the dad was probably very desperate and frantic for a solution. And maybe not finding Jesus was a little disappointing for him. But he would have not have sought the disciples' help if he did not perceive the disciples to be also a solution. So to the dad's credit, he had the right expectations of discipleship. The disciples themselves affirmed their own perception that they could be the solution for this because they stepped into the role. You see, later on in verse 28, they asked Jesus, why could we not cast it out? So they expected that they should have been able to do this. They should have been able to do what Jesus has shown them to do, has taught them to do. Don't you hate those moments? The moments when they're is a perceived problem and a perceived solution, but the pieces don't actually fit together. You think they they should go together. The the, the pieces look like they would. You would expect it to, but they don't. And then the frustration, the disappointment, sometimes the disillusionment also sets in. Then the third layer to this problem was the commotion. 
The commotion begins because the solution didn't work. The expectations of the solution for the problem failed. So the scribes stepped in. The scribes who are not even part of the problem be add to the problem when they step in to argue with the disciples. The scribes who are the scholars of theology and of religious laws, <laughs> they, they have an opinion about this. They have something to say about it. Uh, you can't say like that. You're dealing with an unclean spirit of this nature and you can't do it like that. What kind of spirit exactly really is this? Well, if they're foaming at the mouth, it's probably this. You know? yeah, they have an opinion. Uh, and, and so they believe that from their theological understanding that they have something to say about this. And the disciples are probably thinking to themselves and saying back to the scribes, Jesus taught us to do it this way. You don't know. We're his disciples. This is what he has taught us to do when it comes to performing miracles. We're his representatives. The nine disciples versus the team of scribes are arguing intensely and the crowd forms around them. And the there's adamant views and vigilant points that are being argued back and forth, and the severity of the problem and the drama of the situation intensifies. All around, there's a social dynamic because the crowd is surrounding them, and all this time, the dad with his ill son were there desperately still seeking an answer. They don't care about the argument. They want to find the answer to this in the midst of all this commotion. But not only are they not finding a solution, they're confused about why the solution and the problem don't fit, and everyone has an opinion. When I look at our society today, it seems like in our current state, I see a lot of semblances. Over the past several weeks, many questions arose. What is the, this virus? Where did it actually come from? How did it actually come into being, into our world, into the, the, the humans? stream of infections? How did that even happen? How's it affecting people? How is it affecting our society? How is it being actually transmitted? What are the preventative measures and what could be the solution? And then there's a social element to the problem. We hear criticisms against governments, medical, medical, medical workers, people buying too much or not buying enough, not taking it seriously enough. And like the dad, we're all searching for solutions and not finding it or thinking we found it, but perplexed when something isn't working. And yes, we've been shutting down more and more, and yet the problem still exacerbates. What do we think? What do we do? So then Jesus steps up to the plate. In verse 19, Jesus says, bring him to me. I love that. <laughs> Jesus steps up to the plate and he says, bring him to me. And when the unclean spirits saw Jesus, it convulsed the boy and threw him down. Before Jesus acts, though, he assesses the boy. He assesses, he assesses it further by gathering historical information. He asks, how long has this been happening to him? In verse 21, and the father said, from childhood. See, this was not something that developed yesterday, a year ago or even two years ago. Uh, this has been a lifelong kind of problem. Uh, that unclean spirit had a long-term residence in the boy. The son has been suffering from this condition spiritually and physically, practically all his life. The history of the problem shows that this, there's a severity to the problem. This was no light matter. This unclean spirit has been in permanent kind of residence and influence over the boy. Some of us know about living with a long-term condition. Some of us know about what it means to, to suffer for a long, lengthy period of time, something that you have, you've borne in your own spirits upon your body for most of your life. And you realize because of the length of it, because of the severity of it, you know how deep that problem runs, and it is no light or small thing. Jesus assesses the problem by gathering its history. But notice this too, the Father adds a little bit more to this, to the issue that the boy has been struggling with. He adds and tells Jesus in verse 22, and it has, it has often cast him into fire and into water. To do what? Not to give him a bath, but it says to destroy him. This, this condition that the boy has with the unclean spirit is destructive. 
the, causing the boy to try to hurt himself. His condition is something that needs to be dealt with for the well-being and the sake of the boy. And it indicates how severe the problem is. And you can hear the pain and desperation in the father's voice. Especially when he says to Jesus, if you can, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. First, I love the father says us. This is our problem. This isn't just my son's problem. He's in it with his son. He's suffering with his son. This is our problem. Secondly, I love that the dad calls uh, not for Jesus' compassion. <laughs> See, he, 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 I mean, he calls for Jesus' compassion in that he says, have compassion upon us to care for them who are suffering, to show kindness. And then the third is in, in the dad's conditional statement. But if you can, if you can, do anything. The dad has seen the problem firsthand and likely has tried everything he could to resolve his son's suffering. How many times has he had to save his son from a fire? How many times had he, has the dad had to save his son from drowning? How many times has the dad cradled his son while his son seized, convulsed, and foamed at the mouth. The dad knew the severity of the problem. So can Jesus solve this? But if you can do anything. Here's the fantastic turning point. In verse 23, Jesus repeats the dad's phrase, if you can. Jesus draws attention to this particular part of the dad's plea. Not focusing on the compassion part, but focused on the can. The word can is translated from the Greek term dunamis, which is understood as ability, capability, ability to do something, but literally means power. Power. Do you have the power, Jesus? Do you have the potential, the resources, the might, the authority to actually do something about this, Jesus, is the question at hand. I love this. You know the thing about power? Power is not well wishes, wishful thinking or sentimental sayings like, hope it gets better. <laughs> do you feel as I do sometimes when someone tells you about what they're going through and after they have shared about their, their problem and their, their struggles with something and you say to them, I really hope it gets better. And do you feel that, that sense of, gosh, I feel like a numbskull <laughs> because I, I really want to be able to do something actually substantial to help this person and change their situation. But the problem is so beyond me that all I can simply offer is hope it gets better. Well, the thing with power and the question that the father raises, if you can do anything, he's not looking for a well wish from Jesus He's looking for things to actually change. He's not looking for Jesus to say, hope it gets better. He's looking for whether Jesus has the power or not. You see, the subject shifts and Jesus focuses on this very aspect. The subject of the incident is about the power of Jesus. Jesus helps us understand what power really means with this principle in verse 23, all things are possible for one who believes. He states this principle in connection with power. All things are possible. It is the connection between power and possibility. You see, the thing about power that's not the same as a well wish is power affects change. Power changes situations, transforms circumstances, heals brokenness. Power can actually alter the reality of something. Something is only not possible until there is the power to change it. Power moves the horizon of possibility. The question posed to Jesus is a question about his power. The second part of the principle that Jesus stated in verse 23 in relationship to power is belief. All things are possible for the one who believes. The term for belief is literally the same word for 
faith. If you have faith, the implication in the context here is not a nebulous faith without an object. Faith has to have an object. Faith means to have faith in something or someone. Faith or belief without an object is only, again, sentimentality. What moves the horizon of possibility is power. What enacts Jesus' power to move the horizon is one's faith in him. In trying times, I have tested and will continue to test the fortitude of our spirits. Do we still believe? Do we have faith? Do you have faith in Jesus, not just in Jesus' compassion, whether he cares or not, but in his power to make a difference, power to enact change, power to move the horizon of possibility? I think now more than ever, faith in Jesus needs to be emboldened. But the conversation takes a very dynamic direction here that I love. See, in verse 24, it says, Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. (laughs) And you have to think, what? (laughs) What does he even mean by that? You either believe or you don't. How is it you believe and you have unbelief? Uh, What touches me in this incident is the transparency and honesty of the dad in exposing the dynamics of faith. Faith can be complicated. Within the realm of faith, we find in this statement by the dad, three layers, another taco burrito. (laughs) There is a measure of faith that we can have. When he says, I believe, we can have a measure of faith. It's not that we don't believe, we do believe. Our faith exists, just like the dad. If he didn't have faith, he would not have come searching for Jesus in the first place, believing that Jesus can do this. If he didn't have faith, he he wouldn't have even attempted to ask Jesus' disciples to try to solve this. Uh, He believes that Jesus is the answer. Even after after Jesus' disciples fail to heal his son, the dad was still the first to speak up and answer Jesus' question during the commotion. The dad had a measure of faith, enough for him to take action. But there's the unbelief, which means we can have a measure of faith and still also have a vacuum of unbelief. We can have doubts. We can have questions and not have all the answers. We can have fears and worries. It doesn't mean we don't believe at all because we can still have a genuine measure of faith in the midst of of having a vacuum of unbelief or a lack of faith. What that means is that our measure of faith has room to grow. Our measure of faith can grow. So we can have a measure of faith and a vacuum of unbelief coexisting inside of us at the same time. But yet there's a third, a third layer to this, a third dimension where the dad says, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. I love this statement. Help me, Jesus, to believe you in times when I struggle too. And these are struggling times we're in. In verse 24, it says that the dad cried out. He didn't just say it. He didn't just mutter it. He didn't just mumble it. He cried out from the depths of his aching soul. This is who I am. This is me right now. It was a cry of, yes, I believe. It was a cry of, no, I also don't believe. And it's a cry of, I I have doubts and fears. And, And thirdly, it was a cry of, please, Jesus, help me to believe you more. Because I'm struggling with it. All of that was happening at the same time in this man's soul. If you are wrestling with faith, it's okay to. Know that your wrestling doesn't mean your measure of faith is inauthentic. Your measure of faith is genuine. Know that you can be honest and transparent to Jesus about your lack of faith, about your doubts, fears, worries, and questions. Know that you can ask Jesus for help with where you struggle in your faith. Ask him to help you have faith in newer and deeper ways. You can ask him for help in your struggle with believing, holding on to hope and trusting him. Maybe in your life right now, the coronavirus and quarantine are not your biggest mountains. Your mountain is something else. 
You're struggling to believe. You feel confused. You feel mixed up inside. Well, it's part of the realm of faith. Feel confident about the authenticity of your measure of faith. Be honest and transparent with Jesus about your lack of faith. And then humbly ask Jesus to help you in areas where you wrestle with faith. It's okay to. Finally, from verses 25 to 29, Jesus cast the unclean spirit out. Then the disciples had to ask at the end in verse 28, why could we not cast it out? Again, they had the perception that they should have been able to do it. Jesus' answer was this. This kind, Jesus started off explaining, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. This kind indicates that this was a certain severity of the situation and the problem. And the method needed was prayer. The disciples couldn't command it out on their own in the name of Jesus. They had to pray fervently to God for God to directly act and intervene into the situation. God had to step into it. They couldn't just call it out on their own. But they weren't wrong for trying. Jesus didn't rebuke his disciples for trying. He expected his disciples to try, in fact. Did you notice that? They just were still learning. They still had room in their faith to grow. It was uncharted waters for them. As much as the situation we're in is uncharted waters. But the disciples acted, and they weren't wrong for it. They just need to know the method was prayer. So what do we take away from this? From this passage, I offer to you FAP. F-A-P. F is for faith. Have faith. No matter the severity of the problem, go to Jesus. In our times right now, have faith in Jesus' power to move the horizons of possibility. Be honest and transparent to Jesus about where you struggle in your faith. And give yourself the grace to ask for help from Jesus in the areas where you struggle. A is for action. Act. Kudos to the dad for bringing his son and not giving up even after a failed attempt. Kudos to the disciples for trying to do something about the problem in Jesus' absence. In our times right now, act. Attempt to be part of a solution to make the situation better. Offer help to each other. Several of our members have gone down a list to call up people in our church to proactively check up on them and make sure they are okay. On our Facebook group, a couple of our members have offered to be personal tech assistants for others who are technologically challenged in order to help them order food and supplies. There are people making face masks for medical workers. There are people creating sidewalk art to add beauty to our situation in order to encourage our community and uplift people's spirits. Others are posting encouraging messages and videos on social media. Act. P is for prayer. If there's ever a time to pray, it is not. Prayer is not well-wishing. It is calling for God to move in our circumstances as the as the disciples learned, some situations require prayer. This is a situation where we need prayer. For God to directly intervene on our behalf and into our circumstances. Faith, action, and prayer. And we will beat this. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we bow our heads before you and perhaps even for some of us right now in our, in our living spaces, we're on bended knees before you. For you see the mountain before us, whether it's this coronavirus, whether it's the sheltering in, whether it's a job situation in the economy, whether it's completely something else that's a bigger mountain that we're facing before us. God, we pray to you. And we pray, Father God, that we, that we would declare our faith in you, 
We declare our belief in you as being the creator of the universe, the king of the cosmos, able to move horizons of possibility. And yet, God, you know the areas where we struggle with our faith where we struggle to trust you in some regards. We struggle to hold on to hope. We struggle to make sense of things because we don't have the answers. We struggle with our fears and our worries. And somehow, sometimes we feel guilty for having those fears and worries and doubts. And yet we lay them before you, God. We lay them before you, God, and we ask you, God, by your grace to help us in areas where we struggle to believe. We pray, Father God, that you embolden us you, with, with courage to act, that you embolden us, Father God, to be wise in how we can act and what we can offer into the situation. And we pray, Father God, that we would be praying people, that we, you, we would come before you and you would find us often upon our knees calling out to you because you have compassion upon our world and the power to move the horizons of possibility. So, Lord God, we lift this up to you. We lay this before you. The situation of our world, the situation with our individual lives, we lay before you. And we know, God, that you are a good and powerful God, and you have not forgotten us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Fire. 
So we're going to transition into a time of giving. We're going to pray over the offering in just a second. But I want to remind you of the ways to give during this whole season. Um, you can go to the link in our description in the YouTube video, which is emmanuelburbank.churchcenter.com. Um, and you can click on that. It takes you right to our donate page on our uh, website. And uh, if you don't want to do that, you can uh, also mail your check the old-fashioned way to 438 East Harvard, our church address. And um, I think they still do mail right now during this season. So it will, uh, it will make it to us. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, trusting that you oversee um, all that we're doing and all that we give, um, I just pray that you would prompt us uh, to have eyes to see what you're doing through us, God. Prompt us to, uh, to give like you want us to give in uh, every single way in our daily lives through the week. God, let us see opportunities to shine your light in this world. This is for you, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Man, the worship is so good. I don't know what kind of sound system you're using at home, but this might be the great excuse now to go and order that sound system online to be delivered, not to be purchased in person. This is the time for that. It's not just entertainment. You can say it is for worship. <laughs> well, you know, off camera, I have to confess that I scratched my nose once and scratched my cheek once as well. So it is really hard for me, you know. But we are making adjustments, right? And it is so good to be worshiping with you all this um, Sunday morning, and I look forward to it every single Sunday. And I know that we are going to get through this well. Let's stay in touch with each other. Keep posting your comments on Facebook group. Let each other know how each other are doing. And uh, as you can tell, even our worship online service has been modified a, a little bit. You know, we're providing all the right elements, but because of the new restrictions, you know, there are fewer actually here on the Sunday morning. There's just a handful of us right now, a couple of us uh, here running this. And uh, But we are doing everything we can to still make worship very vital and very vibrant. You know, we normally have a seven-minute mixer uh, back there in the foyer to meet with our new guests. If you've never visited us in person before, we have the seven-minute mixer where we get to go back there, myself and other staff get to meet our new guests, and I'm a very sentimental person, you know, so I'll probably be back there. I'll, I'll just kind of mill around in the seven-minute mixer section for a couple of minutes, seven minutes. I will be back there, so... I want to close this out with a benediction. It comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you back here again next Sunday.